Welcome to Valida's Talk. This is our final episode for this year. And today's topic is the crisis in the Red Sea. My guest is Dr. Salvatore Merculiano. He is an associate professor of history at Campbell University in North Carolina and adjunct professor at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. He holds a master's in maritime history and nautical archaeology from East Carolina University and a PhD in military and naval history from the University of Alabama. Welcome. It's a great pleasure having you on my show. Melina, thank you so much for having me. I have to apologize. I, I'm on the road today. So we had to do this kind of ad hoc. So usually I'd be in my office or my studio, but today a lot going on. I know you wanted to talk about the Red Sea and what's happening. Well, it's really important to cover this uh, ongoing crisis and I couldn't have dreamt of having a better guest than you, to be honest, to cover all the different dimensions of this crisis. And this episode is possible thanks to the collaboration with Bharat Varta, one of India's most famous podcast producers with a focus on politics and society. Now, I would like us uh, to start with a broader overview. Could you give us, a sal let's say, the overview of what's going on right now in terms of the ongoing crisis in the Red Sea? What are actually the most important, let's say, triggers and uh, factors to be considered? Sure. So, I, I mean, what we're seeing here is an offshoot of what's happening in Israel, in Hamas and the Gaza Strip. The Houthi, which are a faction in Yemen, and there's been an ongoing civil war in Yemen since 2011. The Houthi hold what is the western half of Yemen. They're not the recognized government of Yemen, but they hold a substantial portion of Yemen. And they have announced their solidarity with Hamas and the Palestinians in Gaza. And this initially started as Hamas was going, excuse me, uh, uh, the Houthi were going to initially target ships that were either Israeli owned or Israeli flagged. And we saw that in a very dramatic fashion with the seizure of the car carrier Galaxy Leader. This was an attack on the Galaxy Leader by helicopter. They landed on the deck of the ship, seized the vessel, and actually have taken the vessel into Yemen waters and are holding the ship and crew hostage. We then saw a series of attacks on a variety of vessels that were basically thwarted by a U.S. Navy destroyer, the USS Kearney, that was in the area. We then saw a further escalation when the Houthi announced that they were going to be attacking ships heading to Israel or trading with Israel. And then we saw a myriad of attacks take place. But what has made those attacks really significant is the Houthi are not hitting just ships going to Israel or with a connection to Israel. They're hitting ships at random. We saw attacks on ships like the Maersk Gibraltar, which was a Chinese-owned Hong Kong flag vessel that was not going to anywhere near Israel. It was on a, on a kind of a round-robin route around the Mediterranean. And then from one of the most significant was a, sh a ship called the Al Jazeera, which was a, a ship of Hapag Lloyd, that vessel was similarly going to the Mediterranean, not Israel, but that ship was hit by a ballistic missile. And what has happened now is it started with a couple of the major ocean carriers, initially Maersk and Mediterranean shipping, but now has expanded to almost all the major container liners. And now many of the major tanker companies have announced that they're going to bypass the Bab el Mandab. This is the narrow little strait that connects the Red Sea to the Gulf of Aden. This is astride the main supply line or the main ocean route between Europe and Asia. About 12% of the world's trade goes through this route. About 17,000 ships a year transit the Bab el Mandab. And now you're seeing the major ocean carriers announcing they are not going to go through this passage. Instead, they're either going to divert their vessels around the southern tip of South, South Africa, the Cape of Good Hope, or they're going to wait until they can get more security in and around the Bab el Mandab. We're actually seeing ships piling up in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden right now, waiting to see the implementation of a new operation that the U.S. just announced. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, while he's on his junket to the Middle East, announced the Operation Prosperity Guardian. 
And what we expect to see is some sort of naval defensive force going into position, and maybe we will see the resumption of trade. What has happened is that the war risk insurance, the insurance that you need to buy to add on to your normal ship insurance, has increased. It has gone up from about 0.02% of the value of the vessel to about 0.7%. And the fear the ocean carriers have articulated is they're worried about the Bab el Mandab becoming like the Persian Gulf of the 1980s, when Iran and Iraq were involved in a tanker war and they hit over 450 vessels. At that time, the insurance rates, insurance rates peaked at 5% of the value of the vessel. Right now, what we're seeing is maybe tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousand dollars of added cost to sail through the Bab el Mandab. If you go up to 5%, you're talking millions. And right now the ocean carriers don't wanna take that risk. So by pulling out of this route, they're really pushing onto the United States, the Europeans and the Asians, you need to do something regarding this issue in the Bab el Mandab. So, when we talk about the geopolitical context, we see an enhanced risk premium, obviously. We see also that the Houthis were able to attack, actually, the targeting, uh, you know, the targeted uh, ships also thanks to the fact that they are backed by Iran. We see also at the same time that Iran is now more assertive than ever because of the uh, big conflict between China and uh, United States. And we also see that United States is now struggling to somehow redefine its role in the Middle East, uh, given the ongoing military conflict in, uh, you know, Israel. So that means in Gaza Strip, which, by the way, is anticipated to last at least until 2024. Now, what from your view is the current stance regarding the key players? United States, okay, we've heard that it's going to launch this operation, but at the same time, we see that China is quite passive for the moment. What, what is your view on the possible participation of China? At the very same time, we've seen that China has uh, again met with uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. It has brokered a deal between the two states before actually the war broke out in, uh, in, on the 7th of October uh, year in Israel and in the Gaza Strip. So how do you see the possible participation of China? What is uh, also in your view the stance of Russia in this ongoing crisis? Well, I think China has a very unique view because, you know, they have a squadron of ships. The 45th Escort Group is based right in Djibouti, uh, a destroyer, a frigate, and a replenishment vessel. And OOCL and Costco, the two largest state-owned container lines for China, that is, Costco is the third largest container liner in the world. They have their ships hove to right now in the Red Sea. Costco Galaxy is sitting there. So the Chinese are not sailing their ships ships through the area. Their ships have also taken no role in any sort of defensive actions at all. So they're playing a very passive role right now in observing what is happening. The U.S. Navy has been shooting down drones and missiles quite frequently. And if you look at this, it's very, very easy to determine that the U.S. Navy seems, along with the British and the French, have been doing a great job in thwarting these levels of attacks. However, the Chinese have to be watching this and realizing that the Houthi, who literally have no navy and are being supplied from outside sources, have done something that most world navies couldn't do, is they have blocked and, and really impacted global shipping supply in a way that no small player should be able to do. The world's oceans now are being controlled by the Houthi, who have made the largest ocean liners divert around. And this is going to have huge repercussions across the supply chain. Understand, it's, it's already having an impact. We saw the freight rates go up. We've seen the insurance rates go up. We're seeing future markets go up. We've seen the stocks of these shipping companies going up. And for the Chinese, who are absolutely dependent upon this route to be able to get their exports out, they, they have to be 
involved in watching what happens here. The question, of course, is where are the Houthi getting their weapons from? We know they've got Iran backing. We know that. But the style of weapons that we see, and we haven't had a lot of details on specifics about the weapons. What type of UAVs are they using? What sort of air-launched cruise missiles are they using? Are they using a Chinese derivative? That would be, you know, really important information to know. We know ships are getting hit by ballistic missiles. This is the first time ships have ever been hit by ballistic missiles. Are those coming from Iran? Are they coming from Russia? Who's supplying the Houthi? Because at some point you would think the Houthi would be running low on missiles unless they have a supply source that is bringing those weapons in. And so I would argue that you're seeing great power competition right here along the supply route. China has to be sitting there and wondering if the world's major shipping corporations and businesses are not willing to risk their vessels for a few percentage points of insurance. What does that mean if China goes to Taiwan, for example, and they can interdict the world shipping in a similar manner? I, I think many of the world's navies are misreading this situation. They look at the shoot down of missiles and drones as a success. I would argue they're losing because they are not able to protect ocean shipping. And I think if you're a nation like Russia or China, you're taking lessons from that. Look at how Russia has been reeled back in the Black Sea by the Ukrainians. You're seeing the same thing with the world's merchant fleets by the Houthi right now. And we've seen similar things with the Iranians in the Straits of Hormuz. If you, if you look right now, you, you have the Iranians controlling the northern half of the Straits of Hormuz. You have the Houthi controlling the northern half of the Bab el-Mandab. That puts them astride the Straits of Hormuz, the, the shipping route coming out of Suez. That puts them in a pretty good geopolitical position to be able to control traffic. If the Houthi were out in the middle of nowhere and not astride a major maritime choke point, they wouldn't be able to provide the influence they're doing now. But with a little bit of backing, the Houthi are really making the world's navies, particularly the Western, na uh, Western nations, really react to a situation that they're having a hard time fathoming. I even, I think with the announcement by Secretary Austin, we haven't seen the movement of large, massive forces yet. The Eisenhower Battle Group has come out of the Persian Gulf. It's in the Gulf of Aden right now. But we haven't seen the movement of a lot of surface units into this region. We've also seen the re res resurgence of piracy. There was an attack on a vessel at the Central Park. That ship was retaken, but the hijackers were determined to be Somali. And now there's a ship, the Ruan, a Bulgarian-owned Maltese-flagged vessel that has been seized. It was pursued by the Spanish and Indian navies, but now that vessel is in Somali waters. And, you know, a lot of people want to talk about this being the resurgence of Somali piracy. I think it's not so much the Somali piracy of, 20, of the 2000s and 2010s. I think this may be Somali piracy that's being hired out by the Houthi in a privateering manner because we haven't yet seen ransom for the ship because that was the modus operandi of early Somali piracy. And of course, it is important to say that most of the powers that were tackling the piracy problem back in 2010 are still having their military bases in Djibouti, including, including China, right? right? Which I think is not... Not unimportant to say, given the you know whole area of uh, regional power projection, and now given the passivity, as you pointed out, of uh, China, which is in the waiting mode right now. Right, and, and and Djibouti becomes a very big player, especially as these ships are expanding weaponry to shoot down these missiles. You have to go into Djibouti to replenish, and this is a very small base, you know, small port, very vulnerable too. We have a lot going on in the Horn of Africa right now between Sudan and to me through Ethiopia and Eritrea over access to the Red Sea. So there's a lot of politics going on. Of course, you have Somali politics with Somaliland and Somalia itself. Uh, a lot of, of, of moving on the Horn of Africa region. But again, 
come back to that big issue of that trade route. If for some reason we see that trade start getting squeezed out. Now, again, we're still seeing ships coming through. We haven't seen the closing of this route. We're still seeing a lot of ships coming through. One of the interesting players coming through right now is Russian oil. Russian oil is not being bypassed around. It is coming out of the Black Sea out of the Baltic, if you follow the Dark Fleet, those vessels that are moving Russian oil, they're coming through the Suez Canal. They're coming down that region because that oil is heading to India. It's heading to the Middle East. It's heading to China for refining and then shipment back to Europe, America, and many other countries that are involved in this. So the fact that the Dark Fleet is still moving tells me that they're not as concerned about the piracy issue as the bigger companies, which goes back to the motivation for the bigger companies to do this. And also, we've seen for a fact that there have been uh, political meetings between Russia and Iran, and certainly they have discussed some of these uh, ongoing developments during the beginning of the crisis in the Red Sea. So in a sense, I would not be uh, surprised if there is a sort of, let's say, political coordination, similarly to what happened also with, you know, the meetings with the political leadership of Hamas, um, which went to Moscow and then it went to Beijing, you know, to, for, for, let's say, diplomatic talks. So here, once again, we see that there is uh, some hedging, but also some balancing uh, acts. In fact, in Russia right now, there are some talks about the, the possible use of the Northern Sea Route, which presents an alternative to the, you know, to the shipping line, uh, the Red Sea, and then, of course, the most important global choke points that you mentioned, you know, Suez Canal and Bab al Mandeb. And of course, the Northern Sea Route uh, is seen as uh, in the future, especially given the climate uh, change, which is proceeding much much faster than it was originally anticipated like 10 years ago. Now it's much easier actually for commercial use and it uh, gives a lot of leverage from Russian point of view actually to link Asia and, and, and Europe. So once again, here we see some hedging and some, you know, kind of, let's say, use of the situation. How do you see the um, military operation that's been launched now officially? What's your anticipation? How long it will take? And we will see actually direct military clash, like, you know, will it be directly targeted? You know, will, will the Houthis be directly targeted by this military operation? Yeah, let me just, on one thing you just said, and I'll, I'll come right back to that. The North Sea route is an important one for Russia. We saw them touting that when ever given, when sideways in the Suez in March of 2021. And ever since then, they have further refined and developed that route. We are seeing many more ships using that route. So I do think a big power play right now by Russia is to try to sit there and tout that route along with China to get more trade going along that way. Iran is playing a major factor. Iran has a base ship in the southern end of the Red Sea, providing probably intelligence to the Houthis. Some of those initial ship attacks, those ships that came into the Red Sea out of the Suez had turned off their transponders, their automatic uh, identification system. So those ships had to be located some way coming through. So we think Iran probably had an intelligence role regarding that. And, and to come back to the original question, which I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blanking on the original question you were talking about. What was the original question? Well, my question now is um, linked to the your, your assessment about uh, the conduct of the military operation. Okay, the military operation has been officially launched, but how long do you think it's going to last? Will the Houthis be directly targeted? Is it is it actually uh, possible right now to conduct, given the completely different situation as you outlined for us. I mean, this is not uh, the 80s, right? And it's a very, very, very different situation in a sense that now the Houthis, they rely on drones, they rely on ballistic missiles. How exactly is going to happen that, you know, the Houthis will be practically deactivated with the help of this military operation? Well, you would have to assume that the U.S. moving the Eisenhower battle group into the Gulf of Aden region, uh, they have the power and the capability to strike ashore in Yemen. Yet the Biden administration has done everything in their power to not extend this 
this strikes onto mainland. Uh, they seem to want to avoid direct confrontation with the Houthi ashore. Uh, obviously, if you were going to do it, the way to fix the situation is just to get Middle East peace, but that's a big <laughs> solution that's going to be a hard one to do and solve the Israel Hamas situation. I think right now what you're going to see is a defensive position. I think what you're going to see is the U.S. through Operation Prosperity Guardian and CTF-153 are going to want to get as many naval vessels as they can and try to set up a picket try to get a barrier kind of between the shipping channel and Yemen and see if they can catch whatever missiles are coming their way. The problem is that's not going to stop ballistic missiles. Ballistic missiles, because of the nature of the trajectory, is very difficult to stop. And the other fear is the amount of drones and UAVs that come over that some ships could be susceptible to swarm attacks. And you get into this position with what is going to make the ocean carriers comfortable. That's really the big issue. Are the ocean carriers going to sit there and say, if you put a line of ships between Yemen and the main shipping channel, I'll resume my ocean passages. Or are they going to sit there and say, this is still not enough for us. You're going to have to do more. At which point does the Biden administration, along with whatever allies they can drag along with them, sanction strikes, airstrikes, or missile strikes. Because most of these, most excuse me, most of these weapons that are being shot by the Houthi are mobile; they can move around, so they're not in a fixed position. So you're going to have to set up surveillance. You're going to have to identify them, and lots of times you're not going to identify where they are until after they shoot. So you're talking about maybe hitting the launchers and some of the missiles on the ground, but some are still going to be launched. The The hard thing to imagine is that the Biden administration would bring down the Bataan Amphibious Ready Group, which is up in the Red Sea, bring it down to the coast of Yemen and land Marines ashore and clean out. I don't think they really want to get themselves involved in a land war in the midst of a civil war in the Arabian Peninsula. That has not gone well at all, especially after the Biden administration is still reeling from the withdrawal from Afghanistan. So I think what you're going to see is a defensive position right now, kind of similar to what you saw with convoying during the Somalia piracy crisis. But again, this is a much different level of crisis. It's a lot different to scare off a boatload of Somalis with AK-47s than it is to deal with anti-ship cruise missiles and ballistic missiles and swarms of drones coming from them. I think you're going to see an initial response and then we'll wait and see how the shipping lines react. Because understand right now, the shipping lines are, are, are actually in a strange way going to make money from this because the shipping lines were coming into 2024 in a very precarious economic situation. The container liners all had excess capacity. They had too many ships. They had gone on the ship buying spree. They had bought ships like crazy during the supply chain crisis, and they were going to wind up with excess capacity, and that was meaning lower freight rates. This now, this diversion around Africa is going to require more ships, and it's going to be more costly. That's going to artificially inflate the freight rates. On the tanker market, there's not enough capacity. We don't have enough tankers. Nobody's building tankers right now. But the problem we had in the tanker market was OPEC Plus and many other countries, Russia included, had cut back on production, which meant there was less oil out. But now if you have to go longer distances, what's called ton miles, the longer, mo the longer you have to ship a ton of cargo, that means profitability for the container liners and the tankers. And the question is, what is going to convince them it's safe to go through the Bob El Mandat? Unless you have a dark fleet that actually can be moved, still can be moved with, you know, adequate political backing. And that is the dark uh, fleet of uh, Russia, which uh, can offer also uh, much cheaper oil, right? Right. So in a sense, this is actually a good situation uh, for, from Russia's point of view. Oh, it is an immensely advantageous position for Russia because the Dark Fleet, and there was a great report by Lloyd's List, Michelle Weiss-Bachman, who has followed the Dark Fleet immensely. She uh, documented that we still see the Dark Fleet heading through the Suez, heading through the Baab el Mandab because their fuel is in such demand right now. And they're going to be able to get more money. And in truth, they're using older ships. 
ships that should have been probably scrapped years ago. So they'll load those ships up with insurance and they're going to make money whether those ships sail through the straits or if they get hit and sunk. And so they're going to play what's best for them economically. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you've been following all of the most uh, recent uh, cry and cold spots along the global supply chains. And of course, we saw what happened during the pandemic. Then we saw what happened also during the ongoing war in Ukraine with the Russian blockade of uh, the Black Sea. Many don't know that the Black Sea is actually one of the most critical choke points for uh, mostly food uh, actually supply, but to some extent also, of course, energy supply and 60% of uh, Russian trade actually is conducted via this choke point. And then, of course, as you outlined via the Mediterranean and the others, you know, choke points, do you see actually a situation given the ongoing crisis in the Red Sea, where we will see further disruption of the global supply chains, practically what I call a irreversible uh, disruption of the global supply chains, that they will never ever go back to the situation prior to the, you know, the context of the pre-pandemic, let's say 2019. And if that is your view or assessment, what comes next? Uh, are we going to witness a kind of a complete bifurcation where the West will be struggling, you know, to provide for the security of its global supply chains. And at the same time, we will have increasingly an alternative, uh, you know, we will have alternative supply chains that will be more or less facilitated and secured by countries such as China, Russia, to some extent, Iran, etc. I think if you go back to COVID and the disruption caused by the global supply chain, I think that is, you know, that level of the impact it had on ocean shipping is akin to the world wars. You haven't seen a disruption on that level. We didn't have obviously sinkings, but what you saw was massive disruptions. When you looked at 109 ships off the coast of LA and Long Beach, those 109 ships had to come from somewhere. And what they did is repurpose ships off other routes. So we created issues globally with the supply chain. Africa, Asia was disrupted in their ability to get goods because it was much more profitable to put those ships on the East Asia to the U.S. run because you're going to make a lot more money. You're just going to make massive amounts of, prop, of profit. And what we have failed to realize is that disruption is still going on. You cannot reset just, you know, go back to normal. And so what we had was disruptions going across, you know, uh, one of my friends likes to talk about black swan events. And, and you know, we've been, we've been dive bombed by a flat, a flock of black swans here now for a while. They just keep coming. And I, I think what we saw was time and time again, further disruptions to it, ever given getting stuck in the Suez, you had the outbreak of the conflict in the Black Sea. And I think the Black Sea, I, I agree with you 100%, has been underrated and underreported in its significance. I think that disruption, even though it's a cul-de-sac off the Mediterranean, when all of a sudden the world did not intervene, and when I say intervene, I don't mean intervene in Ukraine, I mean intervene in the Black Sea, is to ensure that Ukraine, for example, could safely transport out its goods. Yes, we eventually had the UN agreement that came into place, but when the UN agreement went away, there was really no intervention there. And while many navies will preach freedom of the seas and freedom of, op, you know, freedom of operations, we didn't see that in the Black Sea. Literally, it was Ukraine versus Russia with very minimal help. In, or you couldn't even get NATO to get a anti-mining operation going in there to clear out mines that were largely laid by probably Ukraine and Russia at the time. And that disruption, I think, gave everyone the impression that ocean shipping can be disrupted. It can be disrupted because no one is going to come and intervene on behalf of these open registry ships. We saw ships getting hit from Bangladesh, from Turkey, from you name it, Marshall Islands, Liberia. We were seeing ships hit all the time. And, and I think ships became targets. We know that they're not going to be protected. And now in the Bab el-Mandab, I think ocean carriers are making this case. You know, if you go back to that Iran-Iraq scenario I talked about at the very beginning, we know the U.S. intervenes in that, but that's late in the war. It's 87, 1987 when they intervene, and that's only after Kuwait reflagged their vessels to the U.S. registry. Then the U.S. Navy started escorting them. What the ocean carriers today are demanding 
is the world navies protect their ships regardless of what flag they fly, Panama, Liberia, Marshall Islands. That's fairly unprecedented. You know, in the past, navies would protect their own ships. They, there was a reason to fly. You know, the reason the British Merchant Marine was the biggest in the world was because it had the Royal Navy to protect it. Now these countries or these uh, companies are really demanding this type of protection because they're arguing that it may be flying a Liberian flag, but it's carrying cargo between Europe and Asia. And therefore you have this responsibility. And that resets literally global trade. It puts the ocean shipping companies into a position almost akin to the, the British East India Company of the 17 and 1800s in being able to control politics, economic policy, and, and in this case, military policy. So I think if you look since COVID, you've seen a series of progressions where ocean shipping has taken a bigger, bigger role. The emergence of the dark fleet is, is a good example. We knew about the dark fleet. It existed with Iranian trade and Venezuelan trade for a long time. It just went on to steroids with Russian oil. And the effort by the G7 and the EU to try to cap Russian oil through the use of the P&I clubs, these are the insurance companies that provide insurance, was a very abstract way to do that. And it hasn't really, I would argue, worked to the fullest extent they thought it could. That's why you saw the emergence of the dark fleet and now the emergence of insurance companies in the UAE, in Southeast Asia and in China, you know, China is definitely seeing the opportunity here to get a bigger and bigger footprint on the world's oceans. They're building 46% of the world's ships today. Their mariners are becoming larger and larger on presence on board ships around the world. They largely did that because they wouldn't allow other ships to do crew changes in China. And so if you were an Indian crew or Filipino crew, you couldn't get home. And so it was much more advantageous to put a Chinese crew onto your vessel. So we're definitely seeing shipping playing this big element in the geopolitics of the world right now, more so than I think many nations and militaries realize. I would even go a, a step further by claiming that what we are seeing right now, and uh, we have been witnessing over the last two years, uh, starting with the war of Russia against Ukraine, is in fact the manifestation of a Cold War 2.0 between the United States on the one hand and China and Russia on the other hand, with all these uh, hotspots uh, around the world, uh, from Latin America to the Indo-Pacific, and now with two major wars uh, happening in uh, Eastern Europe and in in the Middle East, and probably with a third front uh, that we will see in, you know, in the Pacific, with uh, China and Russia escalating practically the temperature under the threshold of a kinetic war in the Strait of Taiwan, in the South China Sea, in uh, you know, with the situation of North Korea, and in a sense, I argue that the global supply chains, which have been enabled and facilitated over the last 30 years, thanks to the globalization with uh, American American characteristics and thanks to the American global power projection are no longer there. What is your view on that? And are we going to see more disruption actually along the global choke points? I mean, Black, Black Sea blockade is still ongoing. That makes Ukraine, puts Ukraine in a horrible situation that it has to ship its grain via rail lines, you know, facilitated by the European Union. Same goes for, you know, right now for the Red Sea, as we see, and the situation will be probably going on for months, given the fact that the military conflict between Israel and Hamas is going to continue. The war of Russia against Ukraine is going to continue. And as I said, there will be more hotspots coming up ahead of the election campaign in November next year. I, I, What's your take? I think, I, think, I think when you look at what China has done, China, to me, is it's not communistic, it's not capitalistic, it's mercantilistic. It is, it is very much looking at supply routes and supply chains throughout it. Belt and Road can be whatever you want to look at Belt and Road to be, but what I look at is their ability to establish redundant trade routes 
around the world. You know, why do you go into the South Pacific? You go into the South Pacific, if the South China Sea is closed to you, your ships are going to have to route that way around Africa. Why are you building icebreakers to operate on the Northern Sea route? That's an alternative route. Why do you invest in both ends of the Panama Canal? Why are you talking with Argentina about the Drake Passage? Why the military drills with South Africa between Russia and, and, and China? Well, right now, South Africa is looking extremely important, especially when South Africa is undergoing a lot of disruptions. And so, you know, you definitely see China making inroads. We tend to focus on China building roads and ports and minerals, but trade routes for them are always, I would argue, one of the key issues. When we saw in the midst of COVID, when China and Australia got into their fight, and all of a sudden, Western Australia wasn't exporting the ore and minerals they need. Well, China went to Brazil. They went to Argentina. They went to other routes. And they built that redundancy. One of the reasons for the massive investment in the overland rail route through Russia was to have redundancy in their trade routes. And I, I think this is what China has been doing throughout this entire time, is really building up the redundancy to be able so that if you pinch one supply chain, there are other alternatives to go to. And we see that in shipping all the time. I mean, the, the minute you, you close one route, another one is going to be used. Where it becomes difficult are these cul-de-sacs, the Black Sea, the, 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 the Persian Gulf. But in cases like the Bab el-Mandab, there are other routes you can go, and you're seeing that done. Add to it, we're also seeing natural issues caused by the low water levels in the Panama Canal right now. Panama Canal is at two-thirds the level of, of ship transits. It could be. We're seeing even the big ships that can go through the Panama Canal cannot load to their full capacity. Uh, that's going to have an impact on uh, not just economics, but on uh, uh, energy, because a lot of the LNG that was coming out of the U.S. Gulf Coast that was going through the Panama Canal to Asia, to Japan, to China, Korea, now can't go that way. It was heading through the Mediterranean and the Bab el-Mandab. Well, that's not happening now. Now you're rerouting. And, and so I think China is always looking. And so when you look at, you know, the Cold War, I think you're right, because probably no nation has been the greater beneficiary of the U.S. Navy and freedom of the seas than China has been. Globalization was able to, you know, all of a sudden facilitate the movement of goods in a way never before. Containerization, the growth of the size of ships made transportation costs by the water almost invisible. You know, the, the amount that it costs to move a phone across the Pacific in a, in a, in a 40 foot container, it's not even a penny per phone. You, you don't even see the transportation costs. And now all of a sudden, if you have to start adding cost to this and you have to start getting into great power competition and controlling sea routes, then whoever controls a sea route is going to be really important. And so if you close the Bab el-Mandab, whoever controls that area, you know, South Africa, who controls the Northern Sea Route, the Drake Passage around South America, through the Panama Canal, they become much more important all of a sudden. And they have a lot more influence and say in what is going on in the world. So I, I think China is always, and you hear it, I know, all the time, is they're playing a long game and they're thinking about this. And while China may have one overseas base, they have interest in ports in 46 major ports around the world. And, you know, that is their presence. And they have a, a visible presence in those ports so that they can ensure the movement of their goods. Because if you look what happened in the United States, you can see how ports are easily disrupted. Just take the case of the Cape Orlando, the ship that was activated out in San Francisco. It had to go up to Tacoma, Washington, then down to San Diego, and it moved goods over to Israel. That ship's destination was known from the very beginning, so there was no security on it. The ship was protested in both Tacoma and in San Francisco, uh, and in uh, and in San Francisco. Uh, that demonstrates a liability in ports that are operated by the United States. China doesn't really have that in a lot of their ports. They have a lot of control over their ports. They've automated them. They've brought in their own workers. That allows them to keep the movement of goods going around the world. So I, I think when you look at the Cold War 2.0 scenario, it's definitely the emergence of a great power situation and trade and controlling of trade is as crucial as military is. 
And if we add to all of this analysis an additional layer, that is that the United States and before that also Great Britain have been, and United States is still, you know, a maritime global power, relying mostly on facilitating supply chains, shipping routes, actually based on maritime power projection. We see how, you know, the continental rivals, the axis of China, Russia, now Iran, are facilitating also alternative transport corridors. We saw actually that the international north-south transport corridor between uh, Russia and India that has been negotiated over 20 years has in fact become operative once the war against Ukraine broke out because India had to ship goods to, to Russia and vice versa. So the trade had to be facilitated in a war. Uh, scenario, right? We know, as you outlined, that China has been working on alternative uh, corridors, which are terrestrial corridors for, you know, the, in case that uh, the maritime shipping lines are disrupted, uh, like the middle corridor. And we also saw that one of the most ambitious connectivities, which was the IMEC being announced at the G Summit, G20 Summit in India, uh, and was supposed to connect India with Europe via the Gulf uh, states, such as UAE, Israel, and Saudi Arabia, became obsolete just a you know, month later when the war broke out between Hamas and Israel. So in that context, we see that the maritime powers are now in, under pressure to actually make sure that those global supply chains with their shipping routes are, you know, still operative. And we have this difficult situation, in my view, that this U.S. administration does not want to get militarily involved before the upcoming election. We saw that clearly, of course, and for a very good reason, with the ongoing war in Eastern Europe, but now also with the ongoing military conflict in the Middle East, and obviously, I don't see, as you also pointed out, any re real readiness on behalf of this administration to act swiftly and assertively in the crisis in the Red Sea. No, I, I you know, I, I go back to 2001 when U.S. In, intervened in Afghanistan. One of the things that was done behind the scenes, most people don't even recognize, was the deal that was brokered with Russia to open up supply lines into the Central Asian states so that we could support forces into Afghanistan. So we were sending ships into Vladivostok, into Riga, in Latvia, and then using the Russian rail system to bring goods down to Uzbekistan and to bases there. And to me, that really opened everyone's eyes to the idea that we can move a lot of goods through Central Asia with investment. And you saw China start doing that. You saw Russia start doing that. You saw the development, as you mentioned before, with, with peace deals uh, during previous administrations, opening up the potential for routes that would bypass some of these maritime choke points. Everyone was concerned about the fragility of the Suez. Everyone was worried about after the Arab Springs with what happened in Egypt, what happens to that potential. And you saw a multitude of different supply lines opening up with different alternatives setting up. And again, Israel invading of, of, of Gaza after the attack by Hamas has now really put all that aside. And, and even with the Russia-Ukraine conflict, once Europe said they wouldn't accept trains coming from Russia anymore, well, China built up an alternative route with that coming to the Black Sea and using the Southern Black Sea route to get overland, to, to basically use a, a shuttle service on the Black Sea to move things. And I th again, I, I think we're not watching what's going on. I, I made a joke one day and someone laughed at me about it, but I think it was 100% true that the nation that would maybe intervene on the Black Sea more than anyone else is China, because China had a vested interest to ensure that that overland trade that's now can't go through Russia to Europe is still allowed to flow freely across the Black Sea, it elevates the role of Turkey, which is, what again, what we're seeing because they, they are playing such a role. It elevates the role of Egypt. What's, what does Egypt do if ships stop going through the Suez Canal? They're losing a half a million dollars for every ship not going through. At a point, Egypt is going to have to do something. What's Japan do? Japan has said they're sending a naval task force over. You know, they've changed their constitution now. What happens with Japan now that the uh, Houthi are holding an NYK vessel and been holding it now for over a month? I, I think 
again, what you're creating is is almost akin to what we used to see in the 18, 1900s when all of a sudden someone grabs a, a, a maritime choke point or disrupts trade, you start seeing the intervention. But I, I don't think it's going to be the U.S. because as you mentioned before, the Biden administration has no, it seems, desire to want to get involved in this. They don't want to do it with a year to an election coming up. But there may be other forces at play here that are going to force uh, their hand here. And I thought it was very interesting that of all the nations listed in uh, the, the, the U.S. announcement, you didn't hear Asian, you didn't hear Korea, you didn't hear Japan. I, I didn't hear those nations brought out. It, it tended to be very European-centric. Uh, you know, you had Canada, you had Australia, you had the Seychelles. But th it, the rest of it was kind of the usual cast of characters. India is a we, big player. Germany was missing. Germany, Germany was missing, was missing Germany, also. Germany. It was interesting. It was interesting. That didn't surprise me uh, because Germany has been missing on some of these. But India, for example, India right now is playing a big role in this. India, you know, is trying to develop into a main trans uh, shipment hub. You know, if you look at the top 20 ports around the world, India is substantially missing from that. So India wants to play a bigger role. And, you know, India sees an opportunity here, too. So I, I think we're missing what this really, you know, I've been talking, you know, I, I talked about this story when it first started happening, that I don't think a lot of people were getting the geopolitical impact of what this means. And I think just now we're starting to see it develop more. There was a question actually coming from the audience uh, for you uh, regarding the future role of India. Do you think that this crisis in the Red Sea will be rather beneficial for India or actually rather detrimental to India's uh, interests, given the fact that India is also currently kind of navigating between the BRICS on the one hand, uh, that means China, Russia, South Africa, but uh, also the West on the other hand. I, I think it actually is is advantageous for India for, for a couple of reasons. If all of a sudden you lose that main route, if you lose that route through the Suez, now, all of a sudden, India does play a role because, again, you're talking about extending out supply chains. You're talking about having to set up new transshipment hubs. Sri Lanka has been trying to do that. India has been trying to do it in the Adaman Islands. The Adaman Islands, that gateway into the Straits of Malacca, is actually a very advantageous place for them to go ahead and do that. I, I, I think, you know, you see the growth of the Indian Navy, for example. You know, we keep thinking that, well, the U.S. is going to project power. But I, I, there are other nations now that can project power. You know, a lot of people will look at the Indian Navy, the Chinese Navy, the Japanese Navy. And while they may not be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the U.S., they can definitely go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Houthi without a problem. And it may not be the U.S. intervening ashore in the Arabian Peninsula. It may be another nation intervening ashore. And, and I think that's the other element that we have to be watching right now. How much control does the U.S. have to keep allies, you know, from doing what the U.S. wants them to do? Uh, when you start talking about trade and economics, the people are going to look after their own interests and nations are going to look after their own interests. And if this has a detrimental impact on a nation's economy, they may not want to just follow the lead of the United States. They may want to do something more. If all of a sudden Japan starts escorting Japanese ships, through the straits. If for some reason a Chinese ship gets hit, what happens with the Chinese? How do they react to the Houthi? Uh, you know, the China, I think, could play devil's advocate in the situation. They can supply the Houthi with weapons and at the same time probably bomb the Houthi to make them look good and, and still come out of it in a very positive way. Uh, I, I think the Houthi have, have really just absolutely spun the wheel on what can happen next in terms of uh, the politics in, in that region. Uh, and because you mentioned another important global choke point, uh, the Strait of Malacca, uh, maybe for our audience just to explain that uh, this is uh, one of the most important, actually, you know, <laughs> global choke points for specifically oil shipments to China, which is the biggest uh, importer of uh, oil in the world. So obviously, as you said, you know, India has much uh, bigger role to play in the future, given its, you know, uh, Navy and also being uh, already a security provider in the Indian Ocean. Uh, do you see actually any possibility that we may see another uh, critical situation uh, similar to what's happening now with the crisis in the Red Sea? Uh, let's say um, with regards to uh, the Straits of uh, Malacca or the Strait of Taiwan 
and I don't mean military um, attack by China on Taiwan. <laughs> I mean military tensions and kind of blockades of these uh, other important uh, global choke points. Well, I mean, Singapore is is kind of like the Bab el Mandeb of, of of you know the, of Southeast Asia, except Singapore has developed economically. They've really, I mean, I mean, you know, you talk about a small island that is just economically a powerhouse, and all you have to do is take a look at a marine tracking app and look at the ships that are parked and anchored off there. Many of them loaded down with fuel, just waiting to see where to go to get the most money they can get. Singapore has played that that role. I would also argue Indonesia too is playing a, a much larger role too because of not just the Malacca Straits but the Sunda Straits. If all of a sudden you need to go to the southern tip of Africa, then you know you have alternative routes you can go that way. So I, I think one of the things that's being highlighted right now is the influence these maritime choke points have. It's one of the reasons why China has been so busy developing those islands in the South China Sea. It's really, I would argue, not so much offensive as defensive of their supply chain. They really, they get concerned very much so that, you know, any nation can pinch off a maritime choke point and that's going to interdict your trade. And you need to have those alternative routes to be able to move. So, you know, one of the things we're seeing is really ocean shipping shifting over to Asia. And when I say that, I'm talking about ship construction. I'm talking about ship scrapping. I'm talking about insurance. I'm talking about the operators. I'm talking about, you know, when you look at the dark fleet, for example, the way they tried to control the dark fleet was control insurance. And most of the major insurance companies that were insuring these were European based. Almost all of them were Europe, America based. There was a few in Asia. But now we're seeing a proliferation of them throughout the Middle East, South Asia, and East Asia. And we're really seeing, you know, London, which was always the center for maritime forever, you know, is giving way to Singapore and Shanghai. And there's a lot of tension right now where that base is going to be. Singapore is trying to still maintain it. It has a very interesting relationship with China because it does have a large Chinese population in Singapore. But, you know, I, I would argue that one of the countries that gives China the most angst is Singapore because of its ability to control trade going to and from China. If, if, if tomorrow the Singapore Strait was to be closed, which would be a very difficult thing to do, but if they tried to interdict it and, and slow down the flow of goods through that area, you would see a big reaction from China right off the bat. It, 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 would, be, it would be massive in many ways. It's very much akin to the Turkish Straits and how Turkey controls that flow, except in this case, it's, a, it's an open channel flow. It's not into a one-way ocean, into a one-way cul-de-sac like the Black Sea. There is also another interesting question from the audience uh, on social media. It's coming from John Conrad, who is CEO of G Captain, and he has a question for you, Sal. He asks, asks the following, with the stock prices of Madsen and OSG soaring and geopolitical tensions rising, should the U.S. be making the case to ship owners to reflect? practically to the U.S. Uh, you've been touching upon this issue a lot in your videos. Maybe you could, you know, explain a little bit uh, for our audience and also uh, give us your assessment about it. Sure. So, you know, U.S. Merchant Marine is a very small Merchant Marine, 21st in terms of numbers. But the U.S. subsidizes some shipping firms to have ships under the U.S. registry. Maersk Lines, Hop Hog Lloyd, CMA, CGM. They have ships under U.S. registry. And what's been really interesting to, to, to follow here is that we see ships right now in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden not making the passage through, even though they're U.S. flagged. There are Maersk Lines vessels. There's a, a Willinius uh, Line vessel right now that's not coming through. And it really, I would argue, should give pause to the U.S. military that if U.S. flagged vessels are not going to come through, even with a U.S. escort, you know, there's the discussion has been going on here that a lot of these major ocean carriers have gone to the U.S. government and said, listen, we're not going to sail our ships through the Bob El Mandeb, even if they're U.S. flagged, unless you provide pr protection for not just the U.S. flag vessels, but all our vessels. And, you know, that, that's, that to me is a bit of a strong arm tactic. I think they're using their leverage right now to get protection for their entire fleets. 
But, you know, the entire U.S. military is, is kind of premised on this idea that in time of a conflict or national emergency, you can use the commercial merchant marine to provide the sustainment needed. Uh, you know, the U.S. pays Maersk lines for about 20 vessels. There are 60 ships in what's called the Maritime Security Program. There are 10 tankers in the Tanker Security Program. And if all of a sudden these U.S. carriers or these U.S. flag carriers sit there and say, we're not going to sail into contested waters for fear of the ships. And let's be clear, it's not the ship drivers, it's not the mariners, it's the owners, it's the operators who are doing this. Then what does that do for the U.S. ability to execute military plans? If, if we're seeing right now the Houthi, who have no Navy, literally almost no Air Force to speak of, but with just some shore-mounted missiles are able to cause the world's ocean fleets to divert, then what does that mean for the People's Liberation Army and their Navy and the Chinese ability to interdict trade if they're able to put threats up through maritime choke points coming through the Malacca Straits, through the South China Sea, through the Pacific Ocean, and through other areas? I, I think it really makes everyone sit there and go, well, wait a minute. Maybe it's within the interests of nations to have a core domestic fleet for them. You know, I don't care who ships my goods to the local box store, to Walmart, to Target. I don't care as long as they're cheap and affordable. But if I'm in the military, I kind of do care who's going to bring my ammunition, my fuel, and my food. Because if it's going to be a ship that's going to turn around because they're worried about the insurance, they're worried about the cost then that kind of upsets your, your military planning. And I, I have to think that China, Russia, Iran are all watching this and seeing how they could potentially impact military plans by targeting not the military, which is hard to go against the U.S. military, but much easier to go against the soft targets that are commercial shipping. So, well, we touched upon the geopolitical context, the impact on global shipping, the increased risk, the insurance costs, the military responses, and we even managed to answer some of the questions from the audience. Final question for you regarding the economic implications. We are in a kind of an awkward situation with the central banks actually fighting the inflation, and yet now this crisis in the Red Sea is quite inflationary. So what is your assessment about the disruption in terms of uh, significant economic repercussions? Will we see potential inflation rising? Uh, we saw already some market movements uh, because of the crisis in the Red Sea. How do you see actually 2024 if we assume that the crisis uh, will continue and it will obviously affect, uh, as we discussed uh, over the last uh, hour, a lot of dimensions, what will be, in your view, the, the, the economic implication of it? I, I have an associate who always talks about watching the choke points. I have an, I, my saying is you watch the maritime sector. The maritime sector is kind of the precursor for where the economy, where technology, where almost everything is going to go. And I think what we saw with the global supply chain crisis of 2021, 2022, where we saw record high freight rates, I, that's the, that was the instigator to me to global inflation. It really was. It was, the, it was the thing that let loose what had been bottled up for a long time and really triggered global inflation. I think if this continues, and it's already, it is already started, that we're going to see another bout of inflation as a result of this, because it's going to cause transportation costs to increase. It just is. There's no way around it. You're going to lose voyages on ships going between Europe and Asia because they have to go around Africa. You're going to have to put more ships on trade routes. It's going to become more expensive to move containers, to move energy, to move bulk products. It's just going to make everything more expensive. And that is the, that is the, the recipe for inflation going forward. And I think even if tomorrow we were to hatch a deal with the, with the Houthi and the Bob El-Mandab opens up and you're able to freely move goods, you've already started the process. Because what got me the most about what happened was the ocean carriers didn't say, hey, we're going to divert. You better do something. They said, we're diverting. Go do something now. They're telling you, okay, we're already done it. We already initiated it. Now you have to go fix it. 
And by that process, they have done what we saw happen back in 2020 and 2021, when all of a sudden the freight rates started going up. Because again, that carried over into everything. It was offset by a lot of infusion of money by governments to keep inflation low, to, to, to inject money into the economy. So we saw a lot of money coming out of the nations to prevent that. We don't have that right now. Not only do we not have that now, we see that, that interest rates have climbed quite a bit and still haven't come back down in their levels. People, you know, we may not be in a recession in the United States, but if people go to the market, they see what has cost more for them. And while inflation is not as high as it was, the impact of past inflation is still with them. We see it in the housing market. We see it in building costs and manufacturing costs. I, I think, unfortunately, what you saw here is that Houthi have been able to do something and economically hurt the West in a way that few other entities could do by creating this disruption. So I, I do think inflation is going to be a direct result of what we're seeing right now. Well, obviously, no good news uh, for the consumers uh, either. And Sorry I just that. checked that already 25 25 percent of the shipping is already uh, directly affected uh, by what's going on in the crisis with the crisis in the red sea which is significant one quarter is already actually directly affected thank you very much for joining me and really uh, explaining the situation in a way that's uh, understandable and plausible for our audience and I would like to ask everyone to follow Sal on YouTube. He has amazing videos uh, with a lot of information and analysis and assessment. What is going on with shipping? This is his YouTube channel. And also, obviously, he's very active on social media. You can follow Sal also on Mercurianos on the most famous social media platform, which is now of course, Elon Musk's uh, platform X. Thank you also to our podcast producer for this final episode in 2023. And we will be back with more episodes covering geopolitics around the globe in the new year. Thank you for being with me. Thank you so much for having me.